box plugged in. It's three o'clock in the Eastern time zone and whatever time it happens to be for you locally, we welcome you and we thank you for joining us. My name is Bill Gibbs and I'll be the webinar host. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the second webinar in our CapTech Talks Plugged In series. The plugged in webinars are designed specifically for high school and community college transfer students, but they're really open to everyone. And so whether you're a student or not, uh, we just are glad to have you join us. The um, webinars are presented by current and former students and as well as alumni and faculty. And our presenter today, in fact, is a, um, current staff member and former student of Capital. Capital Technology University is based in Laurel, Maryland, and we'll take a, a few seconds later, later on to talk more about Capital. Uh, this is the series that we're following. We're today, September 25th. We'll talk about the Capital Technology University Disc Golf course companion application and then next week on the third and then the following uh, weeks the ninth the, and then we skip a week and then the 23rd and the 30th as well as November 6th and 13th we have sessions planned. I hope you'll join us for each of these. Our presentation today will be presented by Leif Heaney uh, and uh, he, let's see I want to make sure I get my notes uh, he will talk about Capital Technology University Disc Golf Course Companion application. Here's the agenda that we'll follow today. As I mentioned, we'll have just a word about our university, a bit of housekeeping and session pointers. I'll introduce the presenter and then I'll give it to him for the bulk of our time together. Uh, during the presentation, you can ask questions or you can wait till the end and ask them at the end. Then following the presentation, we will talk about our upcoming webinars just a little bit. We'll talk about how to get a handle on the recording and slides, uh, the certificate program coming up starting next week, and uh, wrap up. We will be done all within the hour. Let's talk just real briefly about Capital. Many of you are quite familiar with the organization, but I wanted to make sure that you knew just a little bit about it. We're a nonprofit, private, accredited university, physically based in Laurel, Maryland, which is about 15 miles to the north of our nation's capital, Washington, DC. We are accredited by the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. This, in the United States, regional accreditation is what we have, is the highest level of accreditation available to colleges and universities throughout the United States. And we hold that distinction of having that accreditation. We're also authorized by the state of Maryland to uh, confer degrees all the way from the associate's degree right up to doctoral degrees. We're very pleased that in uh, earlier this year, we were awarded the prestigious 2020 SC Media Award for having the best cybersecurity higher education program in the United States. And while we're not here to talk about cybersecurity today, this award recognizes the quality of our education across the board. And even though it's particularly in cybersecurity, I think it's representative of the, of the caliber of work that uh, our students are producing and that we are, we're developing in those students. And you'll see that today in our presentation. Capital is the only independent college in Maryland dedicated to engineering, computer science, information technology, and business. Okay, just a little bit of housekeeping and then I'm going to launch right in, have the presenter launch right into his presentation. We'll answer questions at the conclusion, but I would like to add that we will also answer questions as we go. At any time, you have two methods to um, and, uh, ask a question. You can do it through the chat or you can do it through the question and answer peer, uh, box. I do, will note that the questions that are placed in the question and answer box are seen only by the panelists and presenter and not by everyone. The chat box is available and you'll see it is actually open to anyone and everyone will see the question that you ask. We're not activating microphones or webcams for the participants for this session. As I mentioned earlier, we'll be sending a link to the recording to all registrants and, a, and that will be also available on the plugged in webinars page. And we'll talk just a little bit more about that toward the end of the presentation. We always encourage you to let us know how we did 
And as I mentioned earlier, we'll try to wrap this completely up within the hour and let you get on to your rest of your day. Let's talk just briefly about our presenter. Our presentation today is called Capital Technology University Disc Golf Course Companion Application and is presented by Leif Heaney. Leif is a recent Bachelor of Science in Computer Science graduate from Capital Technology University and a current employee at Capital. He is the Assistant Director of Online Learning and User Experience. He's also pursuing his studies toward a Master of Science in Computer Science uh, in the de Computer Science degree program. Uh, his interests within the computer science field include machine learning, artificial intelligence, scripting, app development, as you will see here in this presentation, data analytics, and bridging the gap between sports and technology, which you will also see in this presentation. And with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Leif to you, uh, Leif to you, and let him take over. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate it. Hi, my name is uh, Lee Heaney. Bill gave me a, a great introduction, so I won't go through that again. Um, but I'm going to be talking about uh, myself, disc golf, and the application that I built for my senior design project um, of my senior year of undergraduate um, last spring. So I think it's best to kind of go through um, exactly what disc golf is in the first place. Um, so disc golf is a formalized sport that's very similar to um, ball golf. Um, the, the main objective is to shoot or throw from one location and end up in another. Um, it's kind of an A to B sort of sport. Um, it's, it's fairly rapidly growing. Um, it's one of the fastest growing sports in the country currently, um, and especially around Frederick County. Um, there's about to be about 10 courses there. Prince George's County has about eight or nine. Um, so you've probably seen them in a lot of state parks or local parks. Um, city ordinances are getting into it a lot because it's pretty cheap. Um, it's also a sport that's available for all, for all ages, genders, um, athletic abilities, financial backgrounds. The average disc costs about $10. So when you have one disc that can last you a whole year, um, $10 for the sport in a free-to-play course um, makes it very affordable and a very easy way to get out. Um, it's essentially like taking a nice walk, but you get to do a little bit of throwing and, and spend time with friends instead of just walking around. Um, so like I was saying, pretty much everyone plays um, disc golf. There's really no limitations. Um, I've played with everyone from a, a four-year-old to a, a 90-year-old. Um, I've played with every gender and ethnic background you can imagine. Um, th that boy in the middle picture there, um, he is actually um, low-functioning autistic student. Um, and he plays disc golf almost every day. Um, he uses it to help relieve stress and everything like that. So it's, it's a great sport for really anyone that you can imagine. Um, I play with my family members, with friends, um, by myself. It, it's really a very, very flexible sport. Um, so the, the presence of disc golf at Capital currently um, is, is usable for pretty much everyone. There's a 10 hole course um, throughout campus. It's, it's very beginner friendly. Um, there's multiple tee pad locations currently for um, higher level players and the intro ones I was mentioning. Um, and I felt like this was useful because Capital, because it's a technical school and private institution, it doesn't have a huge athletic presence. Um, there's of course a volleyball court and basketball court, things like that. But there's not really a, a large athletic presence that offers a lot of options. And disc golf is a very affordable and fun way to get into that. So I think disc golf is also a very easy sport to add a technical aspect to and the fact that a lot of the scoring right now is done through mobile devices. So the, the current relevance essentially um, mirrors that. It utilizes technology, but that's only because the sport's big enough for it to allow that to happen. Um, if you look at a chart in this, in this slide here, you see it, there's a massive growth. Um, I mean, every year just based on players, which you'll see in the next slide, there's at least a 10% growth, um, which is huge for a sport in the, the 21st century. That's, that doesn't really happen a whole lot. Um, you don't see growth like that in many, many different athletic activities. Um, and this is really just because maintenance cost is low. 
the construction cost is minimal. A basket costs three hundred dollars, and then laying some concrete down um, compared to the maintenance of a soccer field or the maintenance of a football field and, and grass, all those sorts of things. It gets really expensive really fast. Um, so this is the current relevance of players. The PDGA is a professional disc golf association, um, very similar to the PGA, which is just professional golf association. Um, and like I said, there's a consistent growth of at least about 10% or more for active member registration, but only 13.5% of that is in the, the pro open field. Um, which, which kind of reflects how beginner friendly the sport is. Um, when you have 80% or more people being a, a beginner or an amateur player, um, it really opens up the sport to be available for pretty much anybody. Um, so my, my personal motivation for developing this application um, to give some background is that I, I designed the course initially because I really enjoyed disc golf. I think it's a great opportunity for a lot of students at Capital. Um, and then when it came for senior design, I thought I could really kind of tie in some technology into the design. So I wanted to see an improvement of communication between player and the course developer. Um, with a lot of the courses around Maryland, there's really no modality for the communication from the end user to the developer. So I designed and developed the course, but now I have to find a way to communicate with people using the course so I know how to improve it. Um, so I want to kind of give a platform for polling the player, um, really about quality, poll difficulty, enjoyability, um, pollution, things like that, um, to kind of keep the course as clean and as enjoyable as possible. Um, I wanted to utilize data-driven conclusions so that I can allow the player to see how they're improving, um, allow them to compete with themselves, because a, a large principle of athletics in general is the competition aspect of it. And I also think there's just not enough technology present in disc golf or really sports in general. Um, we see soccer and, and football have a lot of technology integrated, but things like golf and disc golf, even uh, even other smaller games like that, really don't utilize it to the, to the point that it could be in, in my opinion. So this is how technology can interact with disc golf, and I did implement some of these. Um, so data-driven conclusions, which essentially means if I make one hole 1,200 feet long, some people might not like that. So if I see that everyone is getting three strokes above par, I need to, I now have this conclusion that I need to adjust that hole. Um, collecting those statistics and present, presenting them to the, the end user in a, a useful manner. So I'll, I'll, I have a, a short study on a similar application that's out there um, that, that'll kind of relate to this a little bit more. Um, GIS related functionality. GIS stands for Global Information System. Um, it's very similar to GPS, but this is more for um, functionality within an application. So I do use a big portion of this is GIS related. And digital polling, um, which is essentially just to keep it simple, um, like a Google form. And that Google form um, also ties into the Google Maps um, page because some people utilize that for reviews. So here's what the application does. Um, I'm going to be highlighting the analysis GIS and communication parts primarily. I'm, I'm not going to speak on the scorecard um, bit too much right now, but essentially um, the application that you'll see pulls a lot of conclusions um, and analysis and also offers a platform for communication with the, the course designer, which is me, and allows the user to poll. And, and the polling is essentially just for my, my benefit so that I can provide the best course possible for the end user and for myself since I'm out there playing as well. So some of the, the risks that I found um, and, and getting into this part, this I've, I've kind of structured my slides um, in the manner of how you would a, a IT project. Um, so with, with an agile approach to app application development, um, generally you'll assess what you want to achieve, which we just went through, um, how you're going to achieve that. So what sort of functionality, like I said, GIS, polling, things like that. Um, and then you get into risks. So you have risk evaluation. Um, a lot of larger corporations have entire um, divisions to do risk evaluation and write-ups. So my, my basic risk analysis was 
I am the only staff member working on this. I designed the course. I built the course. I mean, I did all the, all the digging, all the installing, and I also implemented the application. So it's very, very easy to get tunnel vision and get out of scope, things like that. Um, and I'll talk about scope a little bit more later. Um, cooperation with the groundskeeper. So, um, I mean, from a very practical standpoint, asking the groundskeeping staff to start cleaning up even more can be a little bit rude. So making sure I, I work with them to, to keep things easy and, and um, clean for them. Um, finances, so I couldn't provide any of my own funds um, and you never really wanna just ask for more and more. So um, funding was, was difficult to plan through. And that also meant that change implementation, which is essentially um, in, in an IT project is, this is impossible without X influx of money. I need more money. So um, no, no project stakeholder really wants to hear that they want more money. So trying to avoid that was also a challenge. Um, time constraint. So I had about six months to develop the application, which isn't terrible, um, but it's not the longest timeline. Um, and that also meant that with COVID, um, I was developing my application during COVID. So a lot of my testing was actually based on user feedback and data. So without being able to have players out there playing it, um, there wasn't too much I could do with the scorecard portion, which is why I won't be talking about it too much. Um, really, I needed about 10 to 20 players on the course to see, um, to get adequate data and, and user feedback. Now, those are the, the high level risks um, that I kind of acknowledged. Um, and then the projected costs, which is fairly simple. Um, when you get into larger IT projects, you'll see a, a 10 page document of projected costs, but I kept mine very, very high level. Um, so the, the Google Play one-time purchase um, developer fee is $25. The iOS developer fee is $99 yearly. Um, web page hosting, which is where I'll move, eventually move my um, Google form to. It's about $5 monthly. So the upfront cost is 129 and then 99 yearly as an up, after the upfront cost. Um, now that's very, very, very cheap, um, which is an upside for disc golf. Um, running an application as a companion application, which is all this is, which essentially means the application pairs with one function, which is the course and it works with one particular end user group, which is all disc golf players. So I was able to keep my projected costs fairly low. Um, I kept my scope very concise and very clear to avoid kind of change implementation costs. And that allowed me to keep my cost to $200 a year max. Now the, the course itself costed more, but I won't go through all the, the projected costs of that. Um, now the scope, which is what I was mentioning earlier, um, just to give a short definition of what a scope actually is. Um, a scope is essentially everything that you'll touch on in your project um, and anything else that's external of that is out of scope. Um, so, so my scope was primarily a web browser interaction, um, any sort of server provision or interaction that may have been necessary, and the big one was GIS or global information systems. Um, so the, the web browser interaction was being able to hyperlink directly to um, either Google or Firefox, whatever browser the user had. Um, I had to make sure that, that was validated appropriately for polling and questionnaires because all polling and questionnaires occur um, via, the, via that browser. And luckily, Capital has a wide Wi-Fi range, so that wasn't really an issue. Um, I also had to embed kind of general information through hyperlinks as well. So that was another piece that was in scope. Um, the disc golf rules and local club information, and you'll be able to see all this um, during the walkthrough, but these are all sort of things that were in scope. And I took mine from a, a high level. I could get a little bit more granular if necessary, but I think some of the code screenshots will show that later. Um, and the GIS, that was the, the toughest one, was being able to track the, the user's location by accessing Google Maps API. Um, that also included time tracking um, and a lot of latitude and longitude calculations relative to the starting position and the ending position. So when you leave your home, you go to work in the morning and you map, you take your Google map, you start at point A and you get to point B. 
Um, and that's essentially what the, the GIS functionality within this application allows me to do. But that actually takes a good amount of API calls and code just for point A to point B travel to even occur. Um, so that was another um, kind of function that was within my scope. Um, that was probably the, the most difficult one as well. Um, so to, to continue the scope, there was a, a database for some of the scorecards. Again, we're not going to go over that one too much. Um, and data manipulation. So the, the big one for this was data presentation, um, being able to cut down certain values and present them to the user in app in a, a relatable way. Um, so as an anecdote, when I first started on the application, I was working on latitude, longitude um, measurements. And some of that includes division to kind of find the hypotenuse between two points. And so with that value, obviously, when you add that division in, um, I would have answers that are like 100 meters. But because um, calculators on computers are so precise, it was like 100.33845 meters. Um, and that helps no end user ever. No one wants to see that value. So that sort of uh, kind of adjustment and manipulation was highly important for the, the user experience portion of the application. Um, I also allowed for, I started with POP3 um, email. I have the, the contact information a little bit hidden well, right now, me. but um, the, the POP3 email and eye mapping was, was fairly simple. That's not too difficult. Really anyone can do that, um, but that was still within scope to a degree. And the social media information, contact information, things like that. Uh, and, and POP3 and IMAP are the, the general, um, generally accepted formats. That's what Gmail uses. Um, it keeps things simple and easy. Um, I've utilized that for other applications as well. So it was just within my knowledge field. Now out of scope gets a lot larger. Um, if I really wanted to list everything that was out of my scope, my list would be billions of lines long. So when you take out of scope, you have to look at it kind of from a business standpoint. Um, what is a stakeholder going to ask you that they're aware of that might be involved? So um, for instance, my stakeholder was the university. So President Sims um, and the director of student life, which was Brandy McKee. So from their point of view, they're going to ask me, what, what is my money going into? And doesn't involve this. So one of those big ones is a, a full website. Will this be a whole website? Will there be dynamic web page interaction, things like that? Um, there, there is not, it's an application. Um, I use browser embedded links, so I don't need a full website. So that was kind of out of my scope. I don't need that. Um, there are no in-app purchases. So that's not something I have to concern myself with. Um, there's no ads or purchasable real estate. So I don't have to consider any sort of marketing plan for that or offers contracts, anything like that. Um, I did not involve any social media that wasn't just an embedded link to Capitals, so I didn't have to consider any sort of RSS feeds or anything like that. Um, no embedded media platform, and there was no chat functionality within the application. Um, so realistically, the out of scope needs to be something that could be implemented, but that you are avoiding. Um, I could implement a full website, but I don't need to. Um, but listing every single thing that's not involved in your application is impossible. So that's kind of why a lot of corporations use business analysts for that sort of position. Um, this slide's a little long. I'll try to highlight it for the most part so I don't bore you. But um, the functional requirements. So, so for newer developers, this kind of gets confusing. There's functional and non-functional requirements. Um, functional requirements are very high level. They generally start with a statement like the system shall or the system will be able to blank. Um, and this is because you are giving your stakeholder a statement that says, my system that I'm building you will do this. And here is, um, here is a statement of fact. Um, it doesn't need to say how it's going to do it. It doesn't need to say why it's going to do it. It just needs to say, here's what it's going to do. Um, and this is really for documentation for your stakeholder. Um, it's to keep a, a goal for yourself and your development. So functional requirements are high level, but they're incredibly important. Um, within agile development, which is the most popular development model right now, 
um, there's a whole step in the process just for requirements gathering. And it's very early on because when you don't have that sort of role in your, your development model, you get lost really quickly or even worse, you start building upon your scope and saying, well, this is cool. I want to do this. And now I want to do this. And you build up and up and up. And then you have the cost for implementation change and things like, like that. So it gets expensive fast to not have your listed functional requirements. Um, so I'll go through mine shortly. The system shall be able to keep track of the user's score on every hole. Like I said, the scorecards we'll talk about um, later, but they're not really involved in this one too much. The system shall offer multiple course layouts. So a, a big one that I'll show you in the walkthrough is um, field work. I, I kind of highlighted field work for this presentation so that you can see what you can kind of do within the app with GIS. The system shall be able to keep track of basic records. So I utilize the temporary data storage within the application, which is actually on the user's um, device, and it stores um, a pinpointed location from their decision. So already I'm kind of getting off track, but you see that when I give the functional requirement, I have no need to explain why or how to this project stakeholder unless I am asked about it. Um, the system shall track GIS data such as location. Um, that that's just if I tap here, if I'm going from point A to point B and I tap here to see how far away this is, it'll track that, it'll present the latitude and longitude or the distance. And that's kind of how the functional requirements work. They're not too complicated, but they're incredibly important. Um, actually local to PG County, WSSC, which is um, the, the water commission down there, I know they have at least five or six um, kind of requirements gatherers. They're all business analysts, but their entire job, nine to five, is to just do this, is to work with uh, the information technology team and highlight all their requirements and then present it to the stakeholder. So it's a very important process in Agile. Um, a few more functional requirements. The system shall poll the user regarding the difficulty and enjoyability of each hole in the course in general. Um, so as a flat statement, that's essentially just saying, I will give you the opportunity to tell me what you liked, disliked, and what you would like changed. Um, so that's a, a fairly easy requirement. Um, the system shall use a questionnaire so the user can voice their opinion. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, a lot of sports don't allow for the end user to voice how they feel. Um, I've been involved in a lot of sports in the past, and I've always felt like the end user, whether you're the player, or you're a supporter, or you're even the parent of a player for younger students, um, there's really not a whole lot of opportunity for town hall meetings or email communication, things like that. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to implement that sort of communication model that allows for open communication between the designer or the, the person running the event and the end user. Um, a top-down view of the map from the system. That, that relates to the GIS data that I was talking about earlier, um, and I utilize Google Maps API for that. And the last one is the system shall contain a general info section that will provide the user with the rules of disc golf and, and more information. Um, that's really a, a perfect example of a basic functional requirement. My application will have a page for X, Y, and Z. And then if that's not clear enough, the statement's not clear enough, um, the project stakeholder will say, why do you want to have uh, Y and Z in your application? Um, so it, it creates a very easy modality for communication when you have functional requirements listed as a, a statement of fact. So now we get into non-functional requirements. Um, and this is a fairly critical concept for developers to understand. So when we are saying functional, we mean high level statements of fact. I will have this, my application will do this. Um, Non-functional requirements tie into functional requirements in the fact that they reference that statement of fact, but they explain how it will happen or what will, what will occur to reach that point. Um, so the first one is the system shall utilize Java for the general development of the application. Um, so when I say I, my system will do this, now I have a non-functional requirement saying, here's how it'll happen. It'll happen through Java. I'll program with Java to make this functional requirement occur. Um, any sort of database involvement was with SQL or SQL. 
Um, the system used a lot of XML and CSS for the front end design of the application. So when I say that general information tab, when I say I want to include X, Y, and Z, now my non-functional requirement that works with that functional requirement says to make X, Y, and Z happen, we will use XML and CSS to implement it. So non-functional requirements generally match functional. They're just more practical explanations of what's happening. Um, the system was developed on Android operating system. The system shall utilize Google Maps API for all GIS related activity. Um, and the system shall use Google Forms for user polling and questionnaires. So, so realistically, when, when working with Agile, which is the approach I took, um, you want to be able to give your project stakeholder a list of requirements that they can approve or disapprove, and then give them a list of non-functional requirements that tie into those requirements so that they understand why what's happening is happening and how it's happening. Um, so when my, my project stakeholder for this beyond the university was my instructor. So when I said my application is going to track your location and allow you to pinpoint it, um, then he goes into the non-functional requirements list and sees, okay, so the system will be built on Java through the Android OS with Google Maps API. So he can tie in the, the practicality of it. Because realistically, I could say in my requirements, uh, my application will launch you to the moon. But if I don't have a non-functional requirement to back that up, that means absolutely nothing. So usually you'll have a similar amount. There'll probably be a few less non-functional requirements um, because they can apply to many, but usually you'll have a similar amount of functional and non-functional requirements but they're, they're both just as important as each other. So we'll, we'll go through a few more, I won't list all of them, but the system shall utilize topographic footage, which is Google Maps. The system will have a basic level security that will allow for open network, network Wi-Fi usage, which is capital is Wi-Fi. The system shall have, will launch with no problems 99 out of 100 times. So that one's included in there to give you an idea of um, kind of not business to business systems, but customer systems. So when you're working with a customer, if I'm contracted to work with a customer, I need to have a statement of fact that says my application that I'm designing for you will launch this many times out of 100 successfully. Um, and I need to be able to provide that fact because if my application doesn't launch 99 out of 100 times, they have the right now to complain and potentially ask for money back if there's a monetary value involved, things like that. So um, it's similar to a, a very modern issue right now with Beacon and Maryland's unemployment system and the fact that if it doesn't launch 99 times out of 100, you're gonna have people complain um, and then you could see a class action lawsuit or, or, or whatever it might be. So those statements are always involved. They're much less important, but they still need to be in there um, just for kind of posterity. And the system shall utilize external third-party websites to provide the user with general information. Um, so you'll see this in the walkthrough, but I included the Professional Disc Golf Association website. I included the official rules, um, the Maryland Disc Golf Facebook page. And some of this is just kind of give the, the user some background about the sport. And then I think I have another link or two in there. But like I said, um, going through this agile process now, after I make these risks, I have to make assumptions. Um, so, so assumptions are very practical in the fact that it's what's happening in the environment around you. Um, so. I had an assumption of basic funding for course maintenance, which means that the university will provide basic funding for mowing the grass and, and cleaning up any dirt, things like that. Um, because if that doesn't happen, the course gets ugly, people don't play. Um, so basic upkeep was a, an assumption. And the, the groundskeepers have done fantastic with that. Um, another one was that the, the course will remain safe, clean, unvandalized, so that I don't have to spend development time to clean up. Now, the constraints, this is pretty much the last step you take before you really get into this next area, which is kind of the, the mapping out. 
Um, so, so my constraints, and this is part of that risk analysis, but it comes later, is that um, they're, they're also very practical, is that the weather may prevent students from playing. So if we had a really rough winter or a lot of rain, people won't play, I won't get the data that I need. Um, not all players bring a mobile device. So some people play disc golf and don't have a phone on them. So they can't download my application and turn I don't get my data. Um, so that's a very practical constraint. Um, now, the last one is kind of large alterations based on the conclusions I receive. So if the course is way too easy and I need to make it difficult and I need more land to do that, the land is limited. Obviously, I can't go too far off campus. So uh, a large constraint is that if there's a big request for more difficulty or longer holes or whatever, I'm completely limited in what I can do there. Now this is, I'll go through these quickly, but these are kind of the diagrams that now you utilize through Agile. So the, the common one is UML, um, that's, that's utilized by a lot of developers, it's not going away anytime soon. Um, and this is my use case. So if you see some of the, the characters in here, I have the facilities team, who I speak to. So there's a double-sided arrow, which essentially means that there's interaction from both sides. I work with the facilities, I work with my project stakeholders, I work with a developer, so in this case it's the same person, but in a general setting you would have two individuals. And the application user or end user now works with this entity here. So in my UML diagram, I have a full entity for the application and all its functionality. So um, general info and web links, analysis, um, GIS relation, things like that. So from a, from a high point of view, this, this diagram should be able to be analyzed by your project stakeholder and understood. That's why we use UML, is to, is to keep communication understandable without having to have a project stakeholder read all your lines of code and try to get through it. Um, and so the relationship diagram, it's essentially the same thing, but it takes a database approach. So I have the time, GIS, conclusions, and a combination of conclusions which involves an interaction between the primary key of GIS and time. Um, a primary key in an entity relationship diagram is essentially um, the, the factor that's involved with the data section. So for a GIS, it's location. Um, the primary key for your, your global information system is where you are at that moment, which is GPS. Um, and then when I want to combine that with what time were you there, then I involve that with the primary key of the time section, which is the actual time. Um, so that's a, a kind of granular view of how an entity relationship works. Uh, context diagram. This one is kind of better seen um, through screenshots, but you can see that there are, is a database, um, API interactions up here, and then over here you have your users. So the user or player interacts with the web browser, which interacts with the application, which is created by the admin. Um, that's essentially how the context diagram works. The context diagram is there to provide that project stakeholder with uh, a very clean visual so that they can understand what's happening, how it's happening, how the interaction's occurring. So, so from a project stakeholder's point of view, if they're a manager, they might not understand how a database speaks to a web browser. They might think that you're running from a database to a web browser when in fact that's not the case. So providing this kind of context diagram allows for you to show them exactly what's happening without having to explain every single step of the way. The process flow diagram, um, some people just call it a, a flow chart, um, but it's, it's the same thing. Um, this is a high level view, but you'll see it better in the walkthrough, um, but essentially the application executes, screen is displayed. You can do field work, Google Maps API is accessed, um, location, time, all that sort of information is tracked. User transactions occur, um, the time and data is archived, things like that. So this is kind of showing what will happen in the, the general, generally accepted process. So while the application does have multiple pathways you can take, um, so just like you go on a website, say you go on Facebook, you could either go to your friends tab, you could go to your status page, you could go watch videos, there's plenty of different options you could take. But the most common use case, which for this application is right now it's field work, 
um, you would want to map out the exact flow of what you expect to occur. So here, this is essentially uh, an on-paper view of what would happen if you were to go on the application right now and, and interact with it. So I won't bore you with every single detail of the process flow, but I'll, I'll show you a walkthrough towards the end of the, the program. Um, the, the data flow, which is also a, a, an important kind of diagram to keep. While the stakeholder is involved in this one, this is a lot for your um, database administrator to evolve. So when, when you're working on a, a project, generally you'll have a team and you'll have a, a database administrator who needs to see all this information. They need to see what data they need to collect, where that data is coming from, where the data is going to, how the data is being stored, and why. So this is kind of showing like here is the communication process. The, the communication is accepted through user input, through a string. Um, it's placed into a temporary file on the user's device. They send that email through POP3 or IMAP. The email is archived in their email database, whatever that might be, likely Gmail. Um, the developer receives that email through POP3 and then the developer can respond in the exact same manner and the process continues. Um, the most important one is the GIS and time processes. Um, so you access the device clock, which is generally open. You access Google Maps API, which you have to allow to happen. Um, you'll pull the data from these sources. So when you access a GPS, you see your time, your location. Um, like if, you, if you're on Google Maps and you start driving somewhere, you'll see a little icon of you're driving up the road, you're going on the highway, whatever it might be. So in this, in this case, I've limited the live movement to be a pinpoint function. So every time you pinpoint, I am now sending an API call to track the time and location that the user is at that point. Um, then I store that data in a temporary file on their device. I present that data to the user in real time, which is saying, if I pinpoint from point A to here, how far is this? And then it says 100 meters and then it'll display that information to a user. And then they can archive that data and the process continues. Um, the management, this is just kind of high level, but this is something you want to in include, um, was done by myself as a senior. Um, the relationships that involved were the stakeholders of Dr. Sims and Brandy McKee. Uh, facilities, which I said was Gary Burke and kind of Brandy as a liaison. Um, the facilities have done an incredible job keeping the, just the general campus clean. Um, so there was never, never any issues there. Um, and the, the course designer and developer was myself. Um, I'm not going to go through the Gantt chart, but this is notable for a lot of younger developers. Um, if you have issues sticking to goals and timelines, you can utilize a Gantt chart. You can set high level goals. So my high level goal here is documentation. Um, I was 99% complete that because I had a diagram that wasn't done. So you can have a high level goal with waterfall goals, which is another approach to development, the waterfall approach, but I prefer agile. Um, and then it'll allow you to decide, here's how much progress I have because I completed this goal by my deadline of November 29th on November 2019. Um, so Gantt charts are very useful for agile development and development in general. Oops. And here's the development and implementation Gantt chart. Um, you see the changes and alterations, so you always want to keep that for when requirements are changed. Um, and you can see that I have kind of de dependencies. So in a Gantt chart, dependencies essentially mean I can't do X until Y has occurred. Um, so in my case, I can't design the backend development and database and QA testing and all that until I have at least some sort of UI or user interface created so that I can interact with the application. So I can't do this until this is done. I can't do this until this is done, et cetera. Oops. Now I'm getting close to the, the end of my time, so I'll rush through this. Um, the, the conclusions, and this is kind of like a debrief of your project that, that'll occur between your team and your primary stakeholders. Um, the, the project kind of has potential to provide a unique and localized manner. Um, it has the flexibility for a number of pathways, which is field work, scorecards, all that sort of inf information. Um, while the, the project was highly prospective, it's very easy to pick up and work on whenever necessary. So like, I'm still working on it currently. 
Um, and I think this could push disc golf into a new kind of technological field that not many people considered in the past. So I'll quickly go through some screenshots and walkthroughs, and then we can do questions so that I don't go over my time too much. Um, so here's some of the, the basic um, overviews. I'll show this more in the actual walkthrough, um, but I tried to keep the, the information very simple. Here's some of the embedded links, um, just taking you to the Maryland Disc Golf page, Capitals website, um, the Professional Disc Golf Association website, and somewhere called Disc Golf Scene, um, which houses tournaments and leagues and all that information. Um, here's some of the, the, the embedded links for polling. So I have a poll created within Google Forms and a review page on Google Maps. And whoops, here is the, the GIS related functionality. So this is kind of the highlight that I'm gonna go through for the next minute or two. Um, this is the API call through Google Maps. So I use Google Maps as API. And this allows me to find capital. So right here you see we're in the United States, then we're in Laurel, then we're at Capitol's campus, and we can see whole one's basket, whole one's tee pad. Um, that's kind of how it, how it functions. Oops. And uh, the latitude and longitude coordinate calculations. Um, so like I said, here's the tee pad right here at the bottom, and the other red marker further up the parking lot is the basket. They are 299 feet apart. And if you throw your shot and you land right here, then I make an API call that pulls that location, um, concatenates the data, and then presents it to the end user to see, I only threw this one um, 80 feet. I'm still 200 feet from the basket. Now that's, that's useful because in disc golf, you don't always have a range finder or you can't always tell the depth of the shot in front of you. It might look like 300 feet, but really it's 400. Um, so having this information that tells you you are this this many feet away helps the user decide what to throw, what shot they may want to take. Um, and that really reaches that functional requirement of tying technology and sports together. Here's some of the back end screenshots. I'm not going to bore you with too much of the code. This isn't all the code, um, but it's just kind of showing um, that I met my non-functional requirements. So I did use Android Studio for a lot of the development. Um, here is some of my, here's some of the code. This is really for the, the, the user interface design. Here is the XML code. This is for Android Manifest, which essentially allows me to call um, a lot of different activities. So when this button is pressed, call this activity, um, which means when this intention from the user presses this button right here, then I want you to open up this screen of the application is essentially what the XML here is doing. The, the Gradle file or build.gradle um, allows me to have these dependencies in here that I was talking about. So I depend on google.android um, play services maps. So this shows me what version I'm on. This shows me what data I'm using to call from APIs. Um, and then up here, I, you can see all my application information, what SDK I'm using, um, what version I'm on, all that sort of information. So the, the stuff you see when you get an iOS update that says you're on version 15.1 and here are changes. Um, this is where that starts from a very, very granular view. This is where you can see all that information. Um, some Java files, I won't go through these. You, can, you can't see them too much, but this is where all the interaction occurs. The maps activity, which is just all the Google Maps information. You can see all the calls on this right side here. Um, I'm gonna wrap this up so I can do the video and questions now. But this is showing you all the maps models and libraries I use. So bitmap, descriptor factory, um, callbacks, Google Maps, latitude, longitude. I mean, there's 18 libraries there, um, which just shows how much interaction is required just to pull your, your location in Google Maps. So I'll go through here and then I'll go through the video walkthrough and I'll take some questions. Um, the video walkthrough is pretty quick. It's only about a minute and a half, but this is just showing you some of the, the functionality of the application. So this is the, the general information tab. Um, it shows you all these embedded links. So that one takes you to the Capitol website. Um, I wanted to include that because we do have an open campus. So if I have someone external from the university come by, um, it's nice to have the opportunity there to show them um, 
here's here's where you are. You're at Capital Tech. Um, here's what we offer. We have all these great degree programs. So while you're playing disc golf, maybe start considering um, maybe I should attend or I should tell family members to attend, things like that. Um, the Maryland Disc Golf Facebook page I included. Um, it's just a good resource to have available. So, um, and then the last one was Disc Golf Scenes website, um, just so you can find tournaments and things like that. Um, it's not, not too interesting. It's just a resource to have available. Uh, we're about halfway through this walkthrough, but the, the primary thing that's important to look at now is the review the course functionality. Um, so there's a Google form and there's Google maps. Um, Google form is a lot more intuitive, but I embedded this link so that the user can tell me what your favorite hole was or what your least favorite hole was. Um, so that I pull that data and I see people really hate hole five. So maybe I should change it. Um, were there any negative incidents on the course, like unsafe tee pads? Um, was it really muddy? Is there damaged property, alcohol or drugs on the course that you see? Um, and then rate the course. And then there's an open text field that says, tell me everything that you don't like that, that you experienced today or everything that you did like. Um, here is the, the Google Maps page. So you can ask questions or review the course on here. Um, a lot of people utilize Google Maps for this information, but it, it's just good to have that hot link in there so that you can save the location. Um, Capital can sometimes be a little bit difficult to find back there in the woods. And then this is the last thing I'll highlight. This is the, the GIS interaction. Um, I only have the one hole. The, the whole course is set up in the application, but I'm only gonna show one hole because it's the same functionality for all of them. But you can see that um, the map zooms in on Capital. So you can see Washington and College Park, Laurel, South Laurel, and then eventually we get down to Capital right there. Um, we have the location, and then for this one, I'm just showing the first hole. It's the same functionality for all of them. There's the first tee pad, 299 feet. There's the basket. So it's like I'm saying, I want to drive from home to the gas station, but now I'm going from tee pad one to hole one. I threw my first shot right there on that blue line. So I still have 137 feet to get to the basket. Um, now my second shot, I only have 68 feet to get to the basket. So now I know maybe I can just throw a putter. Um, now, if I throw a really, really terrible shot, I'm 507 feet away. Um, so th this interaction realistically allows you to track your progress for how you're improving on a specific hole, um, how you're improving on your distance shots, et cetera. There's, I mean, there's so many different possibilities for it. But that's the, the primary function that I wanted to show. Um, so I think with that, that's pretty much my full presentation. Sorry for going over a little bit, but are there, are there any questions that you want to ask in the chat or Q&A? Um, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, right now, hi, thank you. That is fabulous. I, I really enjoyed that. I don't see any questions, but let's uh, uh, take a moment now uh, to uh, see if there's any questions. As I mentioned in the text chat, you can post a question in the chat. Everyone will see it. Uh, or you can post it in the question and answer and only the panelists will see it, but we will answer every question if there are any questions. And um, I know you went fast and furious over that leaf to, to get through all that material. And uh, by the way, if anyone's looking at your video and looking at your picture, you notice that you have um, been uh, working on your facial uh, hair and you look great. The, a um, long time of dedication. <laughs> <laughs> okay, questions. Anyone have any questions? I want to make sure they're covered. Okay. I will go on, but only because I want to make sure that we end on time. However, I'm watching for questions and I'm going to, anytime I see one pop in, I'm going to throw it out here to leave to, to answer. And, but let's continue on now. Let's see if I have, um, um, okay, I'm waiting to figure out how to uh, see if I can get, there I go. Okay. Now, I just want to talk real quickly about all of the uh, things that are coming up. I'm not gonna go into any detail about these, but I wanna talk about the one that starts next week on October 3rd. This is actually a robotics project certificate. By going through those four sessions, you'll see them in colors, red, uh, black, yellow, and green. If you go through all four of those sessions, you will get a robotics project certificate. In the process of going through the four sessions, you will learn how to build a Raspberry Pi 
robot, and then you may compete with other people who build it in a competition sponsored at Capital Technology University in the late fall. So you get a lot of things out of this. One, the information on how to build a robot, and uh, secondly, the certificate, and thirdly, the opportunity to compete. This is not a uh, uh, something for everybody, but if you have ever thought about building a robot, you're going to get hands-on instruction. It'll be presented by one of our faculty members, assisted by actual uh, current capital students who will go through it. Now on November 6th, we'll talk about why is the sky blue? Uh, and uh, if you live in Southern California or California right now, you're probably not seeing too much of that. But one of these days, it will clear up again there. And uh, hopefully it's uh, clear where you are today. And then on November 3rd, the future of unmanned autonomous systems presented by one of our former students who is now an expert in these areas. That's the agenda for the next few weeks. Um, and let me carry on here. I mentioned that uh, this is an actual duplicate of the robotics project certificate that you will get if you attend those four sessions. By the way, if you have to miss one or two, that's okay. As long as you watch it on demand, we'll give you credit for it. Okay, watch for a follow-up link that contains an email to the recording to, for today and information about the upcoming webinar. In the meanwhile, let me look over again to see if there's questions. Um, the, uh, okay, Pam asked a question. I missed the first part. Did you gather information from focus groups prior to planning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually, um, before I really even started my project, and that, that's a good question because in Agile, you do want to, um, converse with kind of external resources. Um, I was on the board for the Frederick Disc Golf Group. Um, so I had a, a Facebook group of 500 people and then some local clubs to, to converse with. So um, I did have a, a basic document that I just asked them to, to provide me some information on, on um, kind of how many holes do you think I should involve in the acreage that I have? Um, what kind of holes do you enjoy the most? Um, what are your favorite types of shots to throw so I can kind of engineer the course to be the most enjoyable for the local population. Uh, so yeah, I did have a, a focus group of sorts. Um, I did have some involvement with them in the past, so it wasn't completely um, new anonymous people, but it was still incredibly beneficial. Thank you. That was a great question. I actually had a question and as early on in the presentation, you talked about iOS and Android mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but the programming language was primarily, the coding was primarily Android, but it is actually, a, uh, would be compatible with, with an uh, iPhone, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have the, the development that I utilize in Android Studio kind of allows you to convert some of those languages that aren't always um, compatible with iOS. So it, it's not a one-click button that converts everything, but it does do a good amount of the work and then I do some of the touch-ups. Um, so right. the, the end goal is once it's published then both app stores to have um, full compatibility for both iOS and Android. And that was my second question. It is not yet published, right? It's still in development? Yeah, I'm still waiting for my, uh, my publishing license to come back. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, be sure to let us know because uh, we'll all be curious. Even though uh, some of us are far from capital, that doesn't mean we don't have an interest in following what you're trying to do here. And uh, I've not been on the capital. I, uh, many people don't realize this. I, I work remotely out of Austin, Texas. So I've not actually been on the campus since pre-COVID. Um, and so I'm eager to see this uh, when I get out there. And um, just uh, for those that don't uh, get to the campus every day, I know you know on your picture you showed uh, where one of the where uh, uh, the first hole is, mm -hmm. but uh, does it do the rest kind of wrap around the buildings or are they all in that general big big area? Yeah, so I I kept it all in of course safe locations, but it really does walk around pretty much the entire campus. It goes um, up along the house line. It comes through that little backfield that we have there. Um, it goes behind the library and everything. So it really shows you every facility that Capital has to offer. And if a student is terrible like I am and throws your uh, your disc out into somebody's backyard, do you have a way to retrieve it? Because I notice there's houses that are right next to the cam campus there. Yeah, we do have some contact with them just to make sure that they're they're aware that there's a course there. We're not just throwing stuff in their yard to throw it there. Um, <laughs> and we also do have a, a student-led group 
I think they call them the, the Flying Disc Club because they also play Ultimate Frisbee, but I'm the, the staff sponsor for them as well. So they have some communication with those people. I think they've thrown a couple in their yard. <laughs> 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 all right okay we are right at three o'clock and i try to end all of these sessions exactly on the hour we have done well this has been a wonderful talk leaf i've thoroughly enjoyed it let me get to my last slide whoops i guess that was the last slide um yes it is the last slide uh just watch for a link to the recording and information on our session next week thank you everybody for joining us and thank you especially lee for this tremendous presentation and uh we are now officially done right at the top of the hour and you can log out at any time thank you very much